Okay, chapter 12 is probability and 12.1 is sample spaces and probability. So let's talk about what a sample space is first. If you're running some sort of an experiment, the sample space is um, just a list of all the possible outcomes. A list of all possible outcomes. Okay, so let's take flipping a coin, for example. Let's say we're going to flip a coin three times, and we're going to think of everything that could happen, okay? So when you flip a coin three times, it could come up heads every time. So I'm just going to put an H to represent heads. So all three um, throws came up um, heads, or we could have two heads and one tail. So let's see, two heads and one tail could look like that. We could get the tail on the last toss, but we could get it on the second toss could look like this, or it could look like this, right? Um, and then we could get one head and two tails. That could look like that, or we could get the head on the second toss, or on the last toss. And then last but not least, we could come, everything could come up tails. So I just was doing a little brainstorming of all the different possible uh, combinations there. Um, okay, and so this is my sample space. The um, number of possible outcomes, well, I can just count up the uh, possible results. So, three, four, five, six, seven. So there's eight ways that this could all shake out. That means there's eight total outcomes, okay? All right, so if you've got a, a relatively small experiment, it's not a bad idea to just write out the whole sample space, but sometimes that's not going to make a lot of sense. And there's a tool you can use called the fundamental counting principle to help speed things up in certain, uh, in certain instances. Okay, so um, I, it, fundamental and counting principle, I said the number of options in category one times the number of cop options in category two. But you could have more than two categories. You could have three or four or five, as many um, categories as you want. You just keep multiplying the number of options in each category. And that will give you the total number of outcomes. Okay, so just to show you with the previous example, um, if you think about your first toss as a category, I know it's not really a category, but um, there's two things that could happen. So there's two number of options in the first um, in the first category. Okay. In the second, on the second toss, there's still two things that can happen: heads or tails. And the same thing on the third toss. And if you multiply these three together, it equals eight. And hey, that's the number of total outcomes. Okay. So um, let's try this on this next problem. Skeletor has three hats, five pairs of pants, and seven shirts. How many possible outfits does he have? Let's assume he's going to use one, um, one hat, one pair of pants, and one shirt, right, from these, these um, options he has in his wardrobe. So um, our first category then would be the hat category, three options. Second category is the pants category, and there's five options. And then our shirts category is uh, seven options. So if you multiply the number of options in each um, category, that's going to come out to 105. You could make an outcome chart. You know, let's say you, have, you could say you have a blue hat, a yellow hat, and a red hat, and you could start kind of listing out all the pairs. But that would take a while. Okay, so much quicker um, to uh, use the fundamental counting principle here. Okay, um, all right, so Beast Man rolls two number cubes. Number cubes, aren't those dice? Well, yeah, they are dice, but if we say dice, then there's dice with more than six sides, right, if you're playing Dungeons and Dragons or something like that. So um, our book calls it number cubes because then we know we're talking about a six-sided um, dice. We're talking about a six-sided die here. All right, so how many possible outcomes are there? Again, I could make a number chart, but let's uh, just do this using the fundamental counting principle. So um, category number one, I'll just call that like my first die. This is a uh, die number one. Well, there's six things that can happen. One, two, three, four, five, or six when you roll one die, right? And then when you roll the second one, the second number cube, also six things that can come up. So if you make a number chart and count them up, there's going to be 36 different um, possible outcomes there, okay? 
All right, that brings us to probability. So um, on the next page, we're going to look at our basic probability formula. So um, probability, often you'll see a P and then something in parentheses. Um, say, you know, you could have P and then uh, 49ers win the Super Bowl or something like that, okay? But this is the, I'm finding the probability of this, okay? And the way this, uh, this works, you're going to take the number of favorable outcomes on top of your fraction here. number of favorable outcomes. And then the denominator, we're going to divide that by the number of total outcomes. Okay. All right. So um, certain things are impossible, and in other certain things are certain. All right, so let's put these on a, uh, on a, uh, on a scale of uh, probability. So an impossible thing, we can say that that has a, uh, has a probability of zero, okay? Which makes sense, right? Zero probability is not going to happen. If something's certain, though, this might surprise you that the um, probability would be one, okay? You might think, well, shouldn't that be 100 percent? Well, yes, it can be written as 100 percent. But this is uh, written as a the, the kind of fraction version of it, right? Um, you know, say uh, three out of three would be one. So it's probability. There's the three out of three chance. That would be a chance of one, okay? And then the zero could be zero percent. So for example, if you've got a half um, one half probability of something happen, that's a fifty percent chance, right? It means it's going to happen one out of two times. This means it's going to happen one out of one time. So every time, right? Okay. All right, so um, Orco is going to roll two number cubes, and we're going to find the probability that the sum is 7. So same thing right here, probability that the sum is 7. Okay, so favorable outcomes over total outcomes. Well, um, let's think about this. Let's do the total outcomes first. We just did this on the last page. When we're rolling two number cubes, the first number cube, six things can happen. Second number cube, six things can happen. So I'm not going to make an outcome chart for all 36 possibilities, but there's 36 things that can happen, OK? Um, all right, so the favorable outcomes, I am going to make a, uh, a little number chart here, or a, 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 a chart for the um, sample space. So um, the first number cube, I'll call that number cube number one, and the second number cube, let's think. If we want a sum of seven, well, you could roll a one and a six. That, those add up to seven, right? Or you could roll a two and a five, or a three and a four. And then I could also roll a four and a three. And some people might say, well, wait a second. We already rolled a four and a three. But this is different when we roll a four on the first number cube and then a three on the second one, OK? Um, so then you know, five, two counts as a new pair as well, and so does six, one. So what the book often does is they say you have a red number cube and a blue one, and that kind of just helps to realize that, you know, rolling a red one and a blue six is different than rolling a red six and a blue one. It's a different outcome, okay? So when I count those, those up, those pairs, there's six of them. So six out of, the, um, out of the 36 total outcomes are favorable, okay? And we want to always reduce this, so usually you leave your probability as a reduced fraction. You could also rewrite it as a decimal to, to fit in, to fit, uh, so that would be, if you did one divided by six, it's going to be 0.16 with the six repeating, okay? Or you could write this as a, uh, as a percentage, and for, as a percentage, you'd move the decimal two places to the right, so this would be 16.6 .6 repeating percent or 16 and 2 thirds percent. Okay, so those are all equivalent, but I'm usually going to leave it like that. Okay? All right, let's try another out. So Shira rolls two number cubes, and we're going to find the probability that the sum is four. So just like on the last problem, there's 36 total outcomes because we're still rolling two number cubes. Okay? And then I'll make a, uh, a chart to kind of brainstorm the favorable outcomes. So I'm trying to get a sum of four. Well, a one and a three will work, or a two and a two, or a three and a one. And that's it. Those are the only possible outcomes, uh, favorable 
um, outcomes. So then um, I would usually reduce this. So let's see, I can divide by three on top and bottom. That's going to reduce to one twelfth then. Okay. And yeah, you could do the decimal or uh, percentage version, but I'll just leave that as one twelfth. Okay. All right. Next up, Tila randomly selects a piece of fruit from the pictured bag of oranges and lemons. See, those are oranges and lemons, right? O's and L's. Okay. All right. So let's find the probability that she selects an orange. So looking at the oranges, hey, there's four of them in the bag. So those are my favorable outcomes. The total outcomes is just the total pieces of fruit, which is six if you count those up, and then reduce. And so it's a two-thirds probability, OK? Um, in this one, on part B, it's going to reset, OK? So let's say we did this and then replaced the, the, uh, the, uh, the orange back in the back. So part B is its own new problem. we got this brand new bag like this with everything in it. And the lemons are two out of the six pieces of fruit. So that's going to be a one-third probability that um, that she would get a lemon. OK? All right. Um, then we're going to move on to something called geometric probability, which works in pretty much the same way with favorable outcomes over total outcomes. It's just with geometric probability, we're talking about um, area usually, okay? So it's going to be the area of the favorable region over the area of the total region. Okay? So let's try this out with an example. When randomly selecting a point within the rectangle, find a probability that the point is within the shaded region, okay? So I call this crazy dart sometimes in my classes. So let's say we have a dartboard like this. It's a, that's a crazy shape for a dartboard, but um, so here's the other thing that's crazy about crazy darts. You're good enough to hit the dartboard every time, but you're bad enough that your dart lands randomly somewhere on there. So we want to see what's the probability that it lands in the shaded region, okay? So I'm thinking, I'm using this uh, formula up here. So the probability then is going to be, um, I'm going to set up a fraction. So the total um, region is the entire rectangle, okay? The shaded region though is going to be the rectangle with the triangle cut out of it. So I'm just going to make a little diagram like this, okay? All right, so I need to find the area of both the rectangle and the, um, and the triangle then. So I'm going to do base times height for my rectangle, and that would be 10 times 4, which is 40. Okay. So I can put a 40 in both of those positions, and then let's work on the triangle. Okay, triangle area form, formula is one half of base times height, or base times height divided by two. The base and height have to be perpendicular, and they are here. The three and the two are perpendicular. So I'm going to get half of six, which is three. And I know it's that many units squared, but I'm just getting the three to put in that position. Okay, and then uh, let's see, do the arithmetic here. I'm going to get 37 over 40, which is actually reduced already, so you can just leave it like that. Or if you made a, uh, if you put it into percentage form, actually divided it and then moved the decimal two places to the right, it would be 92.5%. Okay? All right, last thing. I want to talk about the difference between theoretical probability and experimental probability. Almost always we're going to be using theoretical probability, okay? And it, that's just how likely something is to occur. Okay? But um, experimental probability is a little bit different. It's just going to be based on previous results. Okay, and um, easiest way for me to explain this is with an example. So let's say Evelyn flips a coin five times, and here's what happens: it comes out heads the first four times, and then tails on the fifth um, on the fifth toss. Okay. Um, then it asks for the sixth toss, find the theoretical probability that it comes up tails. Well, theoretically, it should be coming up 
um, one of the two possible outcomes is, is tails. So the probability that it'll come up tails is going to be one half. It's one of two things that can happen. Okay? It doesn't matter what happened in the past when you're looking at theoretical probability. You could flip a coin one million times. If it's a fair coin, on the, uh, the next throw after that, uh, the million and first throw, it should still be one half probability that'll come up either heads or tails. Okay. All right, um, but that's not true with experimental probability. Experimental probability, we're living in a world where this is all we know. Something uh, came up heads four times and tails one time, so we're just going to follow this data, okay? So um, when I'm looking at the um, favorable over the total, the favorable here, well, we're talking about tails, so there's only one favorable and there's five total. So we're just going to assume that this pattern is going to repeat forever when we're looking at experimental probability. So it, it just repeats the pattern of the data you have already. So I look at that as um, the probability. Okay, and that's experimental probability. And, you know, maybe it was a weighted coin and then experimental probability would make more sense. Okay. All right. That's it for um, today and I'll see you next time.